I have a different take on this whole evening. And maybe uh, want to look at it from a different perspective. One simple and one uh, somewhat more serious. About the year uh, 1900, uh, Solomon Schechter came to America from England. Uh, Solomon Schechter was the first Jew permitted at any university in the world to teach anything related to Hebrew, Torah, Bible, or Rabbinics. Because the Christian world uh, taught the world that Jews misunderstand everything about Hebrew, Bible, etc. And he was the first and had the lowest rank. He was an instructor at that time called a reader in rabbinics at Cambridge. He came to America to uh, reorganize something, the Jewish Theological Seminary. When he arrived in America uh, at the ship, he was met by the press. They didn't know who he was, why he was coming here, what he was doing. And they asked him, what is your goal in coming to the United States? He had a Talmud in his hand. Um, and he said, opened up the Talmud, and he's talking to the New York Times as well as the, uh, the Forwards and the Morgan Journal. He's talking to all the press that was there. And he opened up the Talmud. He said, the Talmud starts with the Mishnah, which was written you know, in Galilee, written in Jerusalem, ancient Israel. And he says, this is the Talmud, which is written in Babylonia. Today you would say Mosul, which is where Nahador, Nahador was. And this Rashi lived in France, and the Tosfos lived in Germany. And Alfasi lived in Fez in North Africa, and this rabbi lived in, in uh, Turkey. He's going through all the commentaries, which is a map of the world. And then he comes to the last page, and you know the last page of the Talmud, the very, the very end, it's empty. And he said, here's a blank page, it's an empty page. He says, this is the page that America has to add to the Talmud. Because every Jewish community in the world has added something to the Talmud, otherwise it disappears. So we're supposed to fill the blank page. What is curious to me, on a light level, is that uh, if this theory holds, uh, both the David Birnbaum is from Great Neck and uh, Danny Khalil is from Great Neck. And maybe this is the Great Neck page in Jewish history. Maybe this is the Great Neck page in Jewish thought. If it survives and if it passes uh, the test of time. And from my perspective, I was the shotgun between, uh, between the Khalil and between Birnbaum. Now we'll talk about uh, something serious from my perspective. Um, I visit uh, Jewish patients at uh, St. Francis Hospital, which is a cardiac hospital in Roswell. And I was there one day, and there was a young female patient. Unusual. Generally, you find older male patients in a cardiac hospital. It was a young female patient. And uh, she had a visitor who was either her brother, her boyfriend, or her, uh, her husband, or something like that. So I met with the patient, and I see this young fellow who was dressed like I am. And he had jeans, sneakers, and a sweater, and no tie, sports shirt. So I wanted to say hello to him. I didn't know who he was. And I said, uh, what is your name? I don't know why I said that. He said, uh, Surya Das. I said, you're a Tibetan Lama. He said, yes. How did you know that? I said, I know who you are, and I read what you read. He says, what's your name? I said, Tokaya. He said, you were in Japan. I said, how did you know that? He said, I was in Kyoto when you were in Tokyo. We never met. But he was in his spiritual evolution, which eventually brings him to the Dalai Lama. And he is now number one Tibetan Buddhist in America. He's the head of Tibetan Buddhist in America. He's in Boston. And then he says to me, Surya Das, can you make a Mishabera for my sister? <laughs> a Tibetan Lama asking me to make a Mishaber for his sister. So I said, where are you from? He said he was Bar Mitzvah in Sayasin. <laughs> and I was Obviously he was Jewish. That was his sister. Not his wife or girlfriend. That was his sister. And he's Jewish. And now he's a Tibetan Lama and asked me to make a Mishamera. Tell you another part of it. He's a Buju. He's a Buju. <laughs> <laughs> That's the correct term. There's a Hindu also. So we, I want to deal about deal with that term. Another fellow. David Ben Gurion. Didn't know too much about Judaism, but for whatever reason, he had an uh, infatuation with Buddhism. He was standing on his head and reading a lot of Buddhist texts, caught a lot of flack from the rabbi. He said he wasn't becoming a Buddhist, it was an intellectual study which it probably was. Anyway, David Ben-Gurdi has a close friend, I hope, hope I'm not boring with this, has a close friend 
who's UNU, who was the Prime Minister of Burma, Representative of Burma in the United Nations, the head of the United Nations. He was a close friend of David Ben-Gurion. And one day Ben-Gurion is with him and says, you know, I have a lot of questions about Buddhism. I have a lot of intellectual questions, I have challenges, I don't know how to deal with it, what should I do with it? Maybe you can help me. He says, I'm a politician. I'm raised in from Burma, I'm in a Buddhist country. He says, but I never studied Buddhism seriously, I never was seriously in the monastery. He said, I can't. Just because I'm from Burma doesn't mean I'm a maven on Buddhism. He says, but if you're serious about Buddhism, if you're serious about Buddhism, very serious, with good intellectual questions, the world's greatest Buddhist is nearby in Sri Lanka, Ceylon at that time. Why don't you go talk to him? He said, why don't I should go schlep to Ceylon, you know, I meet a Buddhist intellectual. He says, I don't know where Ceylon is on the map. He says, what language am I going to talk to him? Udo says, talk to him in Yiddish. <laughs> he says, talk to him in Yiddish. The fellow's name is Fenneker. He's from Germany, Austria. Goes through an issue with the Holocaust. Turns his back on Judaism, on Christianity, on Islam. Someone tells him to go to uh, Ceylon and there he will. And as a matter of fact, he goes there. His name is Fenneker. Also has a Buddhist name. And he becomes the number one Buddhist intellectual in the world. Not the Jewish intellectual, he becomes a Buddhist intellectual. There's a woman who is uh, from Germany, refugee in the Nazi times and goes with her family and survives in Shanghai. They go to Shanghai. And she's interested, she's interested in mysticism and in Kabbalah. Interested in mysticism, okay. She writes a letter, correctly so, to Professor Gershom Shalom, who is the, the guru in this academic study of Jewish mysticism. And the Zohar, Shabtai Tzvi, etc. He really was the giant guru, made it mysticism, Jewish mysticism, and, and academic study. So a woman from Shanghai, a young lady from Shanghai, writes to Gershom Shoho of her interest in Buddhism. What should she do? How should she study it? Gershom Shoho writes, what's the matter with you? Get married, have a family, make the gefilte fish, make the chicken soup. This is not anything for a woman to, mysticism is not for you, it's not for women. He says, stay away from it, you have to study the Talmud for it, blah, blah, blah. Throws her out. Gershom Shalom maybe made a, made a mistake. So what does she do? She turns to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And you can read her book, she she writes in English, and is a giant. So what's, the, what's the punchline? What's Pardon? the punchline? The punchline is, <laughs> the punchline is, that I meet all the gurus when I lived overseas. And the gurus tell me that you come from such a spiritual people, such a wonderful people. Why? All of our best followers are Jews. Now they said it to me as a compliment. But I met these young boys and girls. And I saw that they were not angry, they were not bitter. But I had no message for them. And our synagogues had no message for them. I don't know that we were bagels and locks and UJA, etc., etc., etc. The message I want to say is that had Surya Das read these volumes one and two, had Fenneker read volumes one and two, they probably would remain within the Jewish fold. Because they could see that the Jewish way of life, and whether it's putting on tefillin, or going to shul, or keeping kosher, or whatever we do, is the road to fulfill your potential. That's your divine potential. And that's actually what we are doing, and that's actually what they are searching for within our tradition and did not find it. I would suggest that you read the books and read it seriously. You'll learn a great deal.